All right, hello everyone. I'm Keith DeStone uh, from the Harvard University Center for Hellenic Studies, and I'd like to welcome you back to the Cosmos Society online open house series, a venue that is meant to bring current researchers uh, into conversation with the broader CHS community. And our guest today is Dr. Ivan Mariasic, um, who is Assistant Professor in Ancient Greek History at the Kaposkara University of Venice and a current uh, CHS Research Fellow. He earned his PhD in Classics and Ancient History from the Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa and has held a number of research and teaching positions, for the details of which I'll refer you to the full announcement on our website, um, as also for the titles of the several books he's published, two of his own, um, two edited volumes, the title of one I will mention here as perhaps a particular interest to our Cosmos group. Uh, the title is Herodotus, the Most Homeric Historian. He's currently collaborating with Tim Rood of Oxford, a previous guest in this series, and Daniel Sutton of Cambridge on a book on the Thucydides and Studies of the British Classical Scholar and Politician John Enoch Powell, who appears in today's handout, um, and a long-term project titled Memories of Classical and Hellenistic Athens. Um, so Ivan, I'm ready to turn things over to you, um, but as I foretold, uh, I'd like to ask you to begin uh, by sharing with us what it was that first drew you uh, into the study of the ancient world. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, thank you, Keith. Thank you very much for uh, for having me and for this opportunity. It is, uh, and thanks also to the the audience for being here. Um, so yeah, my what what brought me to do what I currently do. Uh, I when I started university, which uh, I'm I'm originally from Croatia, so I moved to I went to Italy to pursue my uh, university studies, and I was wasn't sure whether to which kind of specific field to focus on. There was quite a lot of liberty at the time in choosing the subject. So I went through different courses in, uh, um, in languages and history. And uh, when I when I did a course in uh, contemporary history, there was this old professor, very well known in Italy, a very good scholar as well, who was teaching us with uh, without notes and very kind of passionate talking about the Second World War, the First World War and fascism and Nazism and so on. And uh, but it seemed like everything that one could say has already, already already been said or anywhere. There were so many documents and so many things that you could actually, uh, that there were a few doubts about what happened and how one interprets certain uh, events. Whereas when I took my courses in ancient Greek history and Roman history also, but especially in Greek history, uh, there was all, this, uh, all these things that we don't know about the ancient world but that we, that there are so many, so many gaps in our knowledge from uh, basically from our historical sources, and uh, and this sparked kind a kind of an interest that it was in a field where one could could actually do something new and uh, and also the other thing is uh, is that when you study I think when you study ancient history uh, ancient languages as well um, with Greek and Latin it has also a very long history of more than two thousand years when you can see different developments, not, not, not only in language development for both Greek and Latin, and how this also sparked a number of other languages, of course, in uh, uh, in Europe and other countries, but also also how the, the various events of the of antiquity have been then um, uh, interpreted, studied, and then and shaped somehow also our modern and contemporary world. Uh, which is actually what I am about to talk to you about today. Uh, one specific event uh, that happened in uh, on the island of Milos in uh, Greece, and that is recounted by the historian of the Peloponnesian War, uh, Thucydides. I will pro probably, it should be better if I share my screen. Um, and the handout that I have prepared. So the, uh, the facts are the following. In uh, 425, the Athenians refuse to sign a peace treaty with the Spartans after they have defeated their enemies at Pylos and Spacteria. Uh, but just one year after that, they uh, both Brazida, Brazidas, uh, Sp the Spartan king, and Cleon of Athens are the main um, 
proponents of a continuation of the war die at Amphipolis. And so they, uh, Sparta, Sparta and Athens sign a peace treaty that is was supposed to last 50 years. It did not last that long. And uh, when in, 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 those, in that period uh, that goes from 420, uh, 21, when the Peace of Nietzsche's was, or Nikias was signed, um, to the actual um, beginning of a new phase in the in the in the war with the Sicilian expedition, and then uh, with the so-called Ionian War or the Salean War in 413, there is a period of ten years, more or less, that is called usually called uh, following an article by a famous scholar. Uh, the uneasy peace, and during this uneasy peace between Athens and Sparta, there are many. There were many um, smaller, smaller conflicts. One of these conflicts that Thucydides recalls, which seems like a minor thing in the grand scale of the whole war, is the uh, Milos episode. So, uh, this is the summer of 416, and the Athenians decide to move against Milos, against this uh, this small small island very close to the uh, to the Peloponnese and not that far away from Athens either, uh, which uh, claim to be um, a colony of the Spartans and thus uh, um, and do not want to yield to the Athenian uh, Empire. They, do, they, do, they want to keep their autonomy and neutrality and the Athenians do not uh, are not happy with that. So they sent this um, this army, 38 ships, their Athenians and uh, their allies, around 300, uh, 3,000 uh, soldiers as well. And they, before starting actually the uh, the siege, they decide to send out some embassy, as usually the case in many of these ancient conflicts, to try to negotiate and uh, attempt to uh, avoid actually a uh, an open conflict. But what happens is that uh, usually in Thucydides, when uh, you probably know, there are many speeches by uh, different ambassadors and uh, politicians, strategoi, the generals, and so on. Uh, and these speeches are usually quite long. And uh, then there is the reply by the other side, and, and the, this goes on for a little while. This happens in many in many books of Thucydides' history. But in this case, we have actually something unusual. We have a dialogue. So a direct response after um, short uh, premises that are given by the Athenians. And uh, so they decide to see these stages, this dialogue, which has uh, many, um, many um, philosophical and tragic resonances as well. Of course, um, he stages it in um, behind closed doors, basically. We don't know whether whether to see this. Of course, he, I must say, he probably invented it. Uh, and he, uh, there's a whole debate about the speeches, uh, which I will not go into, but uh, he's tried to be as close to what the uh, what the uh, various persons actually said, which is impossible in this case, if, the, if, if this debate happened behind closed doors, so he might have interviewed someone, uh, he might have found out about it, if it actually happened as he describes it. But this is not the important point here. The important point is that this uh, he uses this dialogue to put forward some ideas about Athens, about imperialism, and, uh, um, and the Athenian, um, the attitude of the Athenians towards smaller, city-states, smaller polis or, uh, or islands. So they are behind closed doors and they do not speak, the ambassadors uh, of the Athenians do not speak in front of the assembly as is usually the case. So this is weird as well, uh, because the, um, the millions decide to send a small number of uh, basically oligarchs. Um, and he said that at the beginning, he says something like, um, I'll go back to the text um, that they have decided not to present the whole arguments in front of uh, in front of the uh, poplethos, the the many, the whole population, but only uh, the oligoi, the few, 
some kind of oligarchs and the magistrates, those who hold the arche. And uh, what happens uh, is a uh, dialogue that goes on for a little while. It's not very long, um, where uh, they try, uh, which has been discussed widely because it's very peculiar and uh, because it gives us a very uh, interesting read on Athenian imperialism. And uh, Ronald Symed, the Roman historian, uh, has called the Million Dialogue the antiphonal sermon on power, which is uh, something we can agree on, probably. Uh, the content, of course, has been uh, debated, and there are, there are many interpretations. I will uh, briefly go through some modern, recent interpretations and then discuss what happens, uh, what happened in antiquity and in some other uh, modern and contemporary authors. The it has been uh, considered the, the whole dialogue as a uh, frank exchange between the brutal imperialistic power and small state interests. In fact, in this case, um, the reality of military power is revealed. Um, and also there is this uh, this comparison, this um, opposition between the laws of nature and uh, and religious laws, religious customs, uh, morality as well comes into play uh, according to the millions. They, sh they were um, they are morally and uh, lawfully um, on on the right side, whereas the Athenians are the, the somehow the bad guys who are trying to. Uh, to exert power on them, even though they have uh, ties with the Spartans. So the millions hope that they will have, that they will receive help from the Spartans and from the gods. Whereas the, uh, the, the Athenians are very pragmatic and they say the Spartans are not going to come to save you because that's what they, they are very conservative in their, in their uh, military um, expeditions. And the uh, the guards have nothing to do with the, this whole business, basically. And what Thucydides says at some point uh, is, this is in the passage, I think perhaps, I think you should see this at, uh, the, so he says that according to, um, We believe, we believe it of the gods. This is num, uh, point two in the, the Athenians' discourse. And we know it for sure of men that under some permanent compulsion of nature, Upofusios uh, and Ankaias, wherever they can rule, they will. Unankrate archein. And we inherited it as a fact, and we shall pass it on as a fact to remain true forever. And we follow it in the knowledge that you and anyone else, given the same power as us, would do the same. So this is a kind of a conclusion of the whole debate. And uh, there is also another point uh, that is perhaps worth making, uh, which is the uh, which has been made by by Jonathan Price specifically in a in a in his book on Thucydides that he talks about the failure of communication in this dialogue, because it is a dialogue, but the two parts are not trying to reach a common ground. They are both, at the, they start with some premises and they end up with the same, um, with their same ideas. They have not changed their minds. And so eventually, even though um, the, the, the millions do, do not want to yield, the Athenians insist on their, uh, on the pursuit of gaining Milos as one of their um, domains, one one of the um, yes domains of the of their empire, and they uh, conclude the dialogue, saying, "Okay, now we go back and uh, to to our camp." The Athenian embassy uh, says, "Go, um, we go back to to our camp, to our ships," and then they start the siege. And of course, the siege ends uh, after a few months with the destruction of Melos. Of the whole island, uh, the the men are um, are killed, and some are enslaved, and the women and children are also sold into slavery. And not only that, but also the the whole island is 
depopulated, uh, they are kicked out, and they are then uh, um, some colonists are brought from Athens. So this is the 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 for some it has been interpreted as a as a real um, representation of Thucydides' uh, views on empire, which is brutal and uh, ruthless. But then uh, these views change somewhat, especially in during uh, the second uh, the twentieth century. And uh, this more uh, realist approach um, has been applied to Thucydides, saying, "Okay, uh, stronger power has the the will and the the power actually to to conquer uh, a smaller state." And this has happened repeatedly throughout history. The second uh, the second passage that I have uh, put on the handout comes from Xenophon's Hellenica, from his Greek history. And uh, I have uh, here collected uh, the only two passages, the only two uh, instances in Xenophon's Hellenica where uh, the episode at Milos is mentioned. And this is uh, in the context of um, the immediate aftermath of the Battle of Egospotami in 405, so which is the basically the final battle of the Peloponnesian War after the battle when the army, when the whole navy of Athens is destroyed by the Spartans with their allies. Uh, they know that this is the end of the war, and uh, they fear the Athenians fear the destruction of their city, and so they say, uh, thinking the Athenians that they would suffer such treat treatment as they had visited upon the millions, colonists of the, of the Lacedaemonians, after reducing them by siege. And then he continues with, uh, Xenophon mentions a number of other instances where the Athenians have been ruthless towards enemies and former allies. And in Hellenica 2, uh, book 2, 2 9, we also find that Lysander, the Spartan uh, general, restored the state to the Aeginetans, another uh, another victim of the Athenian imperial, imperialism. And also he did the same thing for the Melians also, and for all the others who had been deprived of their native states. So the Melians are brought back home, basically. Um, briefly then, we, we should continue, uh, because I, um, obviously this is a theme where one could, one could talk about for, for hours. Uh, and the, the bibliography on this on this whole episode is is really daunting. Uh, the other passage is from uh, Isocrates, the um, orator from the Panegyricus, written around 380, certainly after the peace of Antalkidas in 387. And uh, here again, he um, mentions he mentions uh, the episode at Milos. And also the people of, the, of uh, Chione, Schione, um, which were as well enslaved and destroyed. This uh, is an episode recounted by Thucydides in book near the end of book four. But he this, um, here, Isocrates is defending the Athenian uh, the Athenian uh, imperialist um, behavior because he says uh, that basically. Following one could say to see that this reasoning, uh, they had to do they had to to um, to do what they did because otherwise other other allies would have revolted against Athens, and this means that this was a um, a lesson that the millions had to that the Athenians had to teach not only to the millions but to the other allies as well, and so he defends uh, what was the um, the whole episode. And uh, from Isocrates Panegyricus, we also find out that there is a whole debate, uh, evidently, um, probably among Athenians themselves, but also between different city states within the different polis. Uh, because he says, uh, but from this point on, some take us to task, urging that after we succeeded to the sovereignty of the sea, we brought many evils upon the Hellenes. And in the speeches of theirs, so this is Ambassador. Or other, or other speeches made uh, in Athens or in other places, they cast it in our teeth that we enslaved the millions and destroyed the people of Scione. So this was a debated issue in uh, uh, the early fourth century already. When uh, looking at other instances, there were many other um, 
references to the million dialogue and the million episode, not perhaps not always taken directly from Thucydides, but in some cases, um, as for example in Isocrates, it is not. Uh, it is something that he uh, he does not quote Thucydides. Of course, he quote, he mentions the whole episode as something but well known in Athens in those years. With Josephus, with Flavius Josephus in the first century A.D., where this is a, there is a different story. Um, he uh, is, of course, the Jewish historian of uh, of the Roman conquest of Jerusalem and Jerusalem and Judea uh, after the revolt in um, in the sixties and then the the end of the war in in, the, in 17, uh, 70 A.D. Josephus was part of the whole uh, of the whole revolt at the beginning, and then he was captured, and then he uh, entered into the graces of Vespasian and his uh, his son Titus. So he is at Jerusalem with Titus, with the Romans, um, during the siege of the city, which is in the basically in the final stages of the war, and um, Titus himself sends Josephus as a former citizen, actually of of Jerusalem to try to persuade the people inside uh, the Judeans inside the city to um, to surrender, which is not very a very clever move since they uh, the people inside the city believe that Josephus is a traitor that has shifted and went uh, on the side of the enemy. Anyway, what he says here is, is uh, probably a more or less direct quotation of Thucydides, and I say this uh, not only because he, um, this is passage uh, <clears throat> at the end of 367, this is a long speech that he makes and uh, he reports in his uh, in his work, um, allegedly talking from outside the city walls, and then he uh, was mocked from uh, the Judeans inside the walls. Anyway, he says, uh, Nomon gemen oristai, here it is, and here the translation is something like, even if it not, it's not very precise, I should have given you another one, but anyway, um, there was in fact an established law, a, a nomon, nomos, as supreme among brutes as among men, parathersinis uh, hyrotaton kai paranthropois, yield to the stronger, hekein eikein tois dunatoterois, um, or uh, yeah, yield is probably a good interpretation of eoika. Um, be like, seem like the like the strongest, so follow their their lead. Kaitokratein uh, parois akmeton oplon einai, and the mastery is for those preeminent in arms. And this is the same things that the Athenians mention as a law of nature, uh, a nomos, and the fact of the stronger. Um, having, of course, a brute power on a weaker opponent. Now, in modern times, there are certainly many other examples that I could have uh, chosen. One is this from uh, Friedrich Nietzsche um, in Human All to Human, from uh, published in. Uh, 8078 for the first time, and then republished in various editions. Uh, this is a collection of aphorisms, and this is uh, one of the first, I think the first actually book by Nietzsche with this kind of new way of writing, not a not an essay, but actually a collection of aphorism, aphorisms that for which he became famous. But it is a very different book from the uh, Birth of Tragedy, which he published some uh, in uh, in 1874, and which was a kind of a kind of a scandal among classical philologists, since Nietzsche was a professor of uh, classical philology in Basel at the time, and um, this is even more outrageous for classical philologists for his colleagues. Uh, these kind of books, like uh, Human or to Human, mentally has also mentally has. But here he recalls something about Thucydides as well in one of these aphorisms. Number 892, uh, he says, uh, he talks about the uh, Ursprung der Gerichtigkeit, Gerichtigkeit, origin of justice. And then he says that justice originates 
between parties of approximately equal power, gleich mächtigen, um, as Thucydides correctly grasped in the terrible colloquy between Athenian and Melian ambassadors, where there is no clearly recognizable superiority of force and the contest would result in mutual injury producing no decisive outcome, the idea arises of coming to an understanding and negotiating over one other's demands. The characteristic of exchange is the original characteristic of justice. So in this case, uh, in the case of the million, uh, million dialogue, this, is, this does not happen. And uh, uh, this is why this is a terrible, terrible um, Gespräche. Now, Nietzsche uh, was a great fan of Thucydides. He put this, um, this aphorism in this book, but he also mentions Thucydides repeatedly and the Million Dialogue as well in the, uh, different places uh, in his work. Um, where in, in the Twilight of the Idols, he, there is a section um, which is called What I Owe the Ancients. This is a later work of uh, Nietzsche, and um, and he wrote. He admits that he has uh, he has had little use of Platonism. He didn't use the ancient philosophers to uh, come up with his own philosophy, with his own thinking about uh, about the contemporary actually events mainly. Um, and he believes that Platonism is simply a step towards Christianity. But in fact, he says he admires Thucydides. My recreation, here I'm quoting for uh, an English translation, my preference, my cure from uh, all Platonism has always been Thucydides. So this is uh, quite, uh, quite impressive. And uh, so he knew the Million Dialogue very well. And uh, um, this is why he quotes the whole passage, the um, quotes Thucydides in uh, Human, All Too Human. Now, the last point, uh, which is actually seven and eight, is uh, Johnny of Power, which is someone I've been, I've been working on for a little while. And as, as uh, Keith mentioned at the beginning, I'm uh, preparing a, a, a book on, um, on the Thucydidean studies of Powell. In, um, why, why have I mentioned Nietzsche earlier and then Powell is because there is a strong connection also between the two of them. So just a brief introduction, uh, John of Powell was um, a Cambridge scholar. He um, became professor of Greek at a very young age at the University of Sydney in 1938. Then after uh, a couple of years, even less actually, a uh, year and a half, war started in Europe and uh, of course in September 1939, and he decided to leave his post um, in uh, Sydney and, uh, and go back to, to England to fight against, against the Nazis, basically. And what he, um, at the end of the war, he became a, a brigadier, brigadier general, uh, working mainly in the intelligence in Cairo and in India. And after the war, he did not go back to his studies. He was the uh, appointed professor of, of uh, Greek at Durham in the UK, in England, in Northern England, but he decided to uh, change his career and became a politician. And so he became a, uh, from uh, 1950 onwards, for I think something like 30, uh, 37 years, 35 years, something like that, he was in the British parliament um, among the Tories. And he was infamous. He's uh, quite notorious, especially in England, because he made some uh, uh, speeches, especially one in 1968 about immigration, uh, which was uh, considered very racist. And he um, was became a kind of a fan, um, um, a, a figure, a very important figure in the far uh, right movements in the UK, even today. But before becoming a, a politician and a notorious politician, uh, he was a classical scholar. So he, um, here I have collected some of the of, of what he mentioned about Thucydides and especially the Million Dialogue in some unpublished papers of his that are in Cambridge, in uh, the Churchill Archives at Churchill College in Cambridge. The first one has uh, I have published 
and is online uh, freely available. The, it's, it's called The War and Its Aftermath in Their Influence Upon TCDD and Studies. And the second one is his fellowship, fellowship dissertation. Um, I mentioned Nietzsche also because he uh, was a great fan of Nietzsche. He read, he said in an interview in uh, 1962, in my early 20s, I read all Nietzsche, not just the main works, but the minor works as well, all of them, and every scrap of published correspondence. So he knew Nietzsche very well, and he he also taught that he knew German, basically German mind through Nietzsche, which is why in 1936 he um he believed that war between uh, the British Empire and uh, and Germany, Nazi Germany, was inevitable. And he says in um, he mentions to see these at some point in this short uh, paper that he gave in 1930 in January 1936 in front of an audience of classicists. And he says, the central point on which any moral estimate of Thucydides must always turn is the million dialogue. And in the opinions expressed about the purpose of this dialogue, the change of attitude since the war has been most remarked, most marked. So if before the war, before the First World War, he's talking about the First World War here, uh, Thucydides was seen as a ruthless uh, describer and, and um, of uh, imperial, um, of, imp of Athenian uh, imperialism, uh, after the war, it has been kind of uh, um, given also the the, the facts. Uh, what happened during World War One? The um, scholars started to to rethink the whole million dialogue as something more uh, something practical that the that the Athenians are uh, actually not that bad in uh, in doing what they had to do uh, in those circumstances. And in his fellowship dissertation, which is still unpublished, he says uh, at, the, at the end, I'll just read the final part. Often we hear that Thucydides suppresses moral judgments, rather his moral judgment absent from the outset, because uh, his standpoint is realpolitik, which considers what is, not what ought to be, and views morality and sentiment themselves as but a single force among the many whose interplay makes makes up the grand unmoral or indeed supermoral sweep of history, which means that in the interpretation that has um, emerged after the First World War, especially, and in Powell's, in Powell's view specifically, the Million Dialogue does, has nothing to do with morality, which is also what Nietzsche thought, uh, but it has to do with realpolitik, with a, um, um, with a brutal, um, with the acknowledgement that brutal force is always going to be uh, going to win against a smaller state that wants to defend itself from uh, uh, aggression when uh, this smaller state does not have any kind of uh, help from the outside or uh, uh, or any any power of their own. Which brings us to also to very recent events. Um, I have noticed that at the beginning of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, in some uh, newspaper articles, journalists would start mentioning the Million Dialogue in the same uh, in the same uh, uh, vein of of Powell, basically. Uh, some claiming that it is it was purposeless for uh, for the Ukrainians to resist, uh, and thus recognizing that the that if given the uh, stronger military power of the Russians, it was a good point to just surrender. Uh, but in this case, as is all, as always the case, actually in, the, in different events, there is no no such thing as a as an exact repetition of of the same things. But um, given different circumstances, there are different outcomes, of course. And in this case, of course, there is with the intervention of external forces. Then the war has protracted, has been going on actually for uh, far too long now. Uh, but with this and without any any further uh, moral judgment from my part on on uh, on the international relations uh, and the war in Ukraine, I, I I'm uh, ending my presentation and uh, waiting for your comments, your uh, thoughts and ideas on 
uh, on to CDD's media and dialogue and its reception. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ivan. That was very, uh, thank you. Very thought provoking, I have to say. Uh, let me stop the handout sharing here and change the view here to the gallery view so we can have our uh, conversation more easily. Um, yes, very relevant to current events. Um, let's see, George, I saw a hand. <clears throat> Um, do you have a question or a comment? I was attempting to show two hands clapping. Oh, okay. Say thank you. Great, great lecture. Very interesting. Thank, and I defer to others more skilled in um, historical research. Uh, Gail. Yes, thank you so much, Ian. Even that was a wonderful talk. I happen to be studying Thucydides at the moment myself. And um, one, one thought that I had is that um, the one point that he makes, it seems to me throughout his work, is that in war, um, things are unpredictable. And tables, the tables can turn, so to speak. And um, perhaps, um, you know, there's, there's the idea of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Of course, we're talking about international relations and that it seems that people who advocate the real politic are carving out that sphere as being uh, outside of morality in some way. And yet um, Thucydides also uses juxtaposition to make different points um, as um, Xenophon did. Um, and that, um, and the point which the Melians also make to the Athenians is that uh, in the future, uh, they may be on the receiving end of the, of the um, you know, destructive power. And so um, I just wondered if you might um, see if, uh, ask you if you see anything like that in the dialogue. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, very insightful. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, they are the, the Athenians. They look like very pragmatic um, people in 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 the dialogue itself, which is very crude in in admitting that they they have to do what they do, they, what what they want to do actually to uh, subjugate the millions, but they expect the same treatment in the future. From uh, other uh, other external forces on the on on their own uh, city, basically, uh, which is uh, which is kind of strange also. But uh, and then they also say something uh, like, uh, "Yeah, if our empire would at some point, yeah, um, be uh, destroyed, then uh, this would be the same thing that we would expect from other." From other people, which is actually what what they feared and uh, what what Xenophon reports, uh, which is very interesting to see the the two authors also dialoguing between each other. There is um, there is also the same um, well. There is a, a common a common denominator in all these uh, in all these events that Thucydides recounts and then Xenophon as well, and it comes up very strongly in the at the end of the Sicilian expedition in Book Seven. Of the cities, where they, of course, are, uh, as you probably know, they uh, the the Athenians after two years in Sicily, the, the the whole armada is about to be destroyed in the port of Syracuse, and then they, they there is strong fear among the among the the soldiers, and uh, well, then there is also the, the whole interpretation of of Nikias. Um, um, Behavior during that crisis, which probably to see this did not approve of, because he he believed in he believed Nikias to be too religious, maybe, and um, and so eventually the whole army is destroyed. And uh, and at the beginning of book uh, of book eight, we also see these people weeping in, uh, and crying in Athens because of the of the whole uh, armada this being destroyed, having been destroyed in in uh, Syracuse. Um, yeah, uh, 
I don't know if I've answered your answered your question. Yes, yes. I mean, I think that I don't. I think that um, the, the Thucyd, I just was trying to say that the Thucydides is open to interpretation. That it's not. A, 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 it is a demonstration of brute power. But the question then becomes: Is that the best strategy for the long term? Uh, in the case of Athens, Lysander did spare the Athenians because. In, in, ironically, they were in the place of the Melians during the Persian War. So, you know, so here you have another case where in the case of Athens, uh, they, they stood up to the Persians the way the Melians attempted to stand up to the Athenians. So I think there are many parallels here and, and it's not uh, ad advocates for real politique, I think, uh, perhaps are courting danger uh, um, because uh, you know there uh, there is nothing. All the best laid plans in war can go awry. Um, clearly, the Athenians were should have, if you were taking odds you, at the start of the Peloponnesian War, you would have put your money on Athens. But this is not how things turned out. So I, I just feel that. Thucydides is not a simplistic author who is just making uh, an argument for brute force, yeah. the stronger, you know, over the weaker. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I, I totally agree. There, that, that is why exactly it has been interpreted in so many different ways during so many centuries, actually, of, of reception. And uh, yes, I totally agree. There is, uh, in, in the case of, of some... Uh, yeah, of, of people like Powell, and I think this was also one of the uh, one of the reasons why his why his reading of Thucydides influenced later on his political career, even if it was not recognized, it has not been recognized as such. Uh, but this his interpretation of Thucydides and this uh, absence of morality is uh, is something that he then later used in in, in interpreting international relations between the UK and other countries, the internal internal struggles and, and so forth. So yes, absolutely. And there is, uh, yes, I haven't also mentioned that there is the whole, uh, the whole Persian war background that of course Athens has, there's always this topos of the, of uh, they having stood against the Persians alone and then fought and defeated the, the Persians alone at Marathon. And so this is something that one of the reasons why they have the empire. And uh, yes, and then this is also why then they are not completely um, destroyed after the end of the, of the Peloponnesian War for a kind of, yeah, uh, this one almost a hundred year old events, but they were still very strongly felt uh, in the, at the end of the fifth, but also in the, in the fourth century. And this is quite evident in uh, all the orators, starting from Isocrates to many others. Thanks very much. Yes. Ian, I saw that you had a hand up. I saw a few others, um, but I'll start with Ian. Great. Uh, yeah, I just uh, wanted to mention, although I, I recall that uh, the, the uh, reason the Spartans gave for sparing Athens was their excellent uh, uh, defense of uh, Greece in, against the Persians, I think uh, historians have interpreted it as more relating to Sparta's fear of the growing power of Thebes, that if they destroyed Athens, uh, Thebes would uh, essentially take over Attica. And uh, so it was re real po real politique that actually spared the Athenians rather than sentimental uh, remembrance that's all i want to mention yeah absolutely that's another point as well sure there is um um with, with thebes then becoming one major power in, in the politics of central greece and of the greek world in general of course yeah i was um well i always also um, thought about how could actually one one let's say superpower such as sparta uh, completely an, annihilate uh, Athens. I mean, the the biggest at the time city in the in the Greek world. This would have been also very costly and then problematic as well, and uh, it wouldn't probably have led to 
too much of a positive outcome that's for sure and yes the, the menace from Thebes from uh, let's say north of Attica would be would have been even stronger but yeah and then after of course after the end of the Peloponnesian War for uh, around 10 years uh, as you know I suppose uh, the the Spartans held the hegemony of of Greece with the with the support of the Persian and their money and uh, which was brought to an end by a coalition of different cities including Corinth, Athens, Argo um, and so on in um, and the end with the with the with the Persian uh, Persian help but then yes the, the the first half of the fourth century before before Macedonia comes into play with Philip II uh, the these whole uh, there is a very complex equilibrium um, complex balance between all these different city states and uh, no certainly no no single unique superpower as as with the yeah as with the Athenian Empire even though not completely alone of course with the Spartans and their allies uh, kind of trying to keep it um, in uh, check let's say thanks very much for your comment Jack do you still have a question yeah, or comment uh, and then Elen after, after yeah uh, well you know I, I, I I've read uh, I read Thucydides when I was a graduate student, uh, it was undergraduate and graduate, and uh, and since uh, you know I've gone back to it over and over again, and uh, I'm impressed um, about the secondary literature that you know a lot of ink has been spilled over uh, Thucydides uh, nitpicking uh, points. Uh, I've I've come to a um uh, conviction that Thucydides is an honest historian and uh he probably had a lot of sources that he didn't um blab about um to to put this this history together and this dialogue may actually be from somebody's notes that was provided to him uh it's it's awfully um uh, true to 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 other um, statements. Uh, if so, uh, anyone writing on Thucydides should at least read the whole Thucydides carefully, not just you know the favorite parts. And um, and and uh, digest Thucydides' uh, long-term visions. And uh, his uh, ability to to see things in a in a dispassionate way, you know, here's a guy who was a um, what was he an admiral or whatever his uh, uh, rank was that was uh, you could say probably rather unjustly uh, fired, uh, but you know he took it like a man and uh, made the best of the hand he was dealt. And uh, realized that this was going to be a, a big war, you know. Just even seeing what was what Corinth was stirring up in 432, um, and so he follows through on it. Anyway, I see these threads uh, of things that come up in the Melian dialogue through Book One and and on uh, through Book Three and uh, Four, and you know. I, I, I was so interested in the in the uh, Isocrates quote you had there. You know, the guy is pretending that the war was going on. Wait, this was during the peacetime when they're out there on a on a frolic. Uh, you know, to I uh, maybe so there are these historians, even including Gom, you know, that you know don't seem to have any clue as to. Athens' motivation, which is, which Thucydides has made so abundantly clear, you know, th throughout the history, they did the the Athenians were short term thinkers in with people like Alcibiades in power, and what did they get? They wound up weakening Greece so that 
it was uh, taken over by Macedon in the next century. And, you know, Sophocles put, puts a lot of wisdom out on this subject. And I think it's in the Trachinii about how, you know, one, one should, should deal with one's enemies in war uh, sparingly uh, because you may need them uh, in the next conflict. And I think Demosthenes in the next century grasped that. Helene was talking about how in the uh, Demosthenes' speech for the Rhodians, you know, that the Athenians should not be thinking about revenge and this and this Melian uh, disaster in, in uh, 426, uh, excuse me, 416, you know, may this be a revenge uh, killing for not, uh, Nicias is not doing the job the first time they attacked Milos. Anyway, uh, I, I think uh, Thucydides deserves a lot of credit for um, perceptive analysis and uh, honesty. Yep, absolutely, I agree, thanks. Um, I also find it very, um, almost curious that he managed to interpret the whole, the whole uh, uh, war as a single conflict which is so difficult to do when you are in the middle of the events, actually. And when he claims that he realized immediately that it was, this was a conflict that was going to last mm -hmm. and that was going to be so uh, important. I mean, he, maybe he wrote it and uh, with hindsight, uh, but still uh, considering the whole, the whole period from 431 to 404 as a single war is actually... Um, his uh, this is his war I, I believe i mean he he invented it basically because otherwise if we didn't have to see this we would talk about the archidamian war for from 431 to the peace of nikias uh we would be talking about the sicilian expedition like single episodes but then he made the whole the whole thing a single conflict and this is uh really extraordinary because usually historians say it, it takes like a generation or two to realize how things develop and then uh, what are the final outcomes of certain events. Um, it is really unfortunate that he did not finish the, the, his work, that he uh, probably died some sometime around 400, we don't know. And this has also caused, uh, um, I'm, I'm using caused like uh, in a negative sense, the publication of so many books and articles on this. Thucydides Frage, since the 19th century, German scholars started with the with the with the problem of the author, but not authorship, but the the final book, which doesn't have speeches, and so how does it fit in the whole in the whole scheme of the of the histories, and why does this does it not end? Um, does it not go to the end? And then there is the the continuation of the of the work by by Xenophon. Um, and uh, well, he was probably working fast because he knew he was not going to live forever, and uh, he wanted to get his message out. And uh, these, uh, I, I, I saw that note of Gum on uh, the passage we're talking about, about how uh, someone said that Thucydides didn't uh, write anything with uh, uh, Sunithia, you know. The ordinary ordinariness, you know, he chooses his words very carefully, and um, and especially in this million dialogue. So he probably uh, did refine whatever notes or whatever he information he got. Uh, but uh, you know, it's that's that's a lot of times you you know, like Franz Werfel, his last novel, The Stern der Erlösung, I think it's no, that's that's uh, Rosen, sorry. Um, Anyway, the um, I'm getting the title wrong. His last novel, you know, he he knew he was dying, and he wrote he wrote he wrote this huge, probably his greatest novel, you know, in a very short time. But you know, it 
uh, he didn't he didn't work on it the way Joyce worked on Finnegan's Wake. Yeah, sure. There is a I don't recall now. I think Rollins maybe or someone else, or someone, or even Momigliano in the in the early twentieth century believed that the Million Dialogue was like the was supposed to be the in the real the in the core center of the of the histories, like um, as a turning point. So he interpreted inter interpreted it as a as a very key passage. But then you know, like also in a um, so a way to interpret the whole the whole uh, the whole work. Uh, there is um, yeah. yeah. What what I wanted to say. Um, And uh, and another another in interesting thing, in my opinion, when you when you go through reading the whole, as you as you did, you said, and um, the the whole to see this, then you you come to the fifth book, and this this very actually weird weird dialogue, uh, complex also from a linguistically point of view, uh, and after that, the whole debate about the Sicilian expedition starts in the sixth book and and the uh, Sicilian disaster. So it's um, reading it through. It seems like to see this was already giving a judgment on the, they they did that to the millions, but then almost the same happened to to the to the Athenians in Sicily. So this is also another another point that yeah one should make when when not when not not just picking different parts, which is usually how how someone how not only scholars but also in different contexts in schools in uh, in lectures one one pick some some portions of to see this or one book or uh, some episodes because it's of course it's a long book and with the greek with the difficulty of the greek as well um it's not always easy so it, it has to one has to take their own time to to go through it yeah which is always worth uh, worth it any, anyway hey Lynn, um let's have your your question or comment and this should be the last one as i look at the yeah book. yes First, thank you so much for this outstanding presentation. Very, very interesting. Uh, I just have a small, uh, two small little comments or questions. Uh, do we have other uh, written sources about why the Spartans did not show support or come to the aid of the millions? No, I don't think so. No, I, I'm not sure. No. Uh, but no. I not aware of, of other sources, um, as always is the case with with, this, with the Peloponnesian War, we have um, almost always, we mainly have the point of view of Thucydides and the Athenians, mm. um, which is not always helpful um, and creates a lot of problems because the Spartans, of course, they, I mean, we don't have, we don't have direct sources such as uh, the, such, such as Thucydides, we don't have a, a counterpart from Sparta telling us the same story from a different point of view. But yeah, yeah I don't know. I don't know if there is any, any explanation for that. Um, there is also this continuous um, repetition in the dialogue, but also in Isocrates and in, in other sources, I think in the Mostanis too, um, about the, also in Xenophon, right? Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, Epoison Melius de la Cedamonion Apoikius, Apoikius. So they are uh, Apoikos of of Athens. They are uh, they insist on this on this fact, even though we don't know actually the the relationship between Sparta and and uh, the Melians. Uh, it has been argued also that I, uh, quite unreasonably uh, because I don't understand exactly how. One can interpret the uh, the Panegyricus text as to see it is inventing the fact that the Melians were colonized the, were colonized by the by the Spartans, and so that actually the fact was, according to this scholar, that um, the Melians have been part of the empire and uh, and were just punished out of uh, I don't know brutality or whatever um but i i i don't think we we actually know that there is another than a reply on this 
on this work from the 90s was that we have uh, no evidence that there is uh, that the millions were not colonists. So what Thucydides says is probably true. Mm. But apart from that, it's, it's difficult to say, I'm afraid. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. The only, uh, the other little comment I wanted to add is, even if Thucydides does not plainly uh, engage himself in saying they are right, they're wrong, you know, with his style uh, and choice of words, he really shows <laughs> which group he favors in a way, you know, he shows that the Malians are victims. And uh, I really admire uh, Thucydides' style and uh, his use of syntax and uh, of words. So it was just a little comment. Of course, yes, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I've also recently read, um, I think in, in Jonathan Price's book on Thucydides and uh, internal internal war i think it's called anyway the uh, he at some point he uh, took the first part of the dialogue and made uh, and uh, eliminated the what the millions say so that it becomes a whole speech in the manners of the usual speeches in Thucydides, uh, which is quite interesting because uh, if you do that then you see that the athenians have a train of thoughts that is actually very uh, precise and they start from start to finish it makes sense even if you take out the di the dialogic uh, sequence whereas mm -hmm. for the millions they try to respond to these uh, to the to the athenians and they come up with uh, always the same kind of um responses and they they don't have a precise idea of where where they want to i mean how they want to defend themselves apart from the usual the usual uh, uh, invocation on uh, the unmorality of their attack, the the the, the gods uh, and uh, the Spartans' connection. So it's it's also I think an interesting exercise to 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 try to um, destructuralize the 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 dialogue and uh, and uh, in this case, yeah, it. In uh, in in Price's opinion, I think he was looking at the um, specifically at the Athenians' point of view, which, in his opinion, is also to see this point of view. Well, Ivan, thank you very much. This is wonderful. Um, yeah, for, thank you for sharing your you know, overall knowledge and your your current research with us. Thank you so um, much. Thanks to those of you who attended here with us today, and thanks to those of you out there watching. Uh, see you next time. Okay, we're off.